We do nasty things to our leaders. We shoot them in the streets of Dallas and uh, uh, hang them on pieces of wood at Golgotha. We fondly say that in the United States we separate church and state. That's an asinine statement. I am a political animal, and I've really never left journalism. I'm writing about the current scene. The metaphors are there. I'm writing about the political ecology, the... Uh, religious ecology, the social ecology, and the physical ecology of our world. And I think you do not separate any one part of this from the others. You don't separate mind and body and understand the human being. In this exclusive Walden Tape special edition... We're proud to present author Frank Herbert and filmmaker David Lynch discussing the making of Dune, the motion picture. Following some insights into the filmmaking process and challenges faced by writer-director David Lynch, Walden Tape spoke directly to Frank Herbert about beliefs, values, and his writing. Join us now for a truly unique experience with two magnificent artists of our time. Listen, learn, and enjoy. Walden Books is proud to have the opportunity to speak with author Frank Herbert and director David Lynch. David Lynch is, is not only the director of Dune, the motion picture, but also the author of the screenplay. And right beside me is Frank Herbert, the author of the book and, of course, all of the subsequent books which have become so immensely popular. The first question that I wanted to ask was of the filmmaker. Did you feel threatened by the fact that, that so many readers had had no doubt seen Dune so many times before they'll have the opportunity to come into the theater and see your Dune? What was the question? No. <laughs> you got to be either uh, stupid or crazy, you know, to do something like this. And I live in fear 24 hours a day. So you're, you're definitely cognizant of the, of the, the stature. Yes, what but I you say... Why don't you ask me the question? Because I've seen the film. <laughs> <clears throat> no, somebody has to do it, right? Yeah. And someone had to do it. And um, I was... I, the, the day I finished reading the book... I met with Dino in his office, and I was so high from finishing the book, so and so thrilled with you know what I'd read. Uh, I I signed on, and I didn't really know it was going to be three and a half uh, of this type of you know a year. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I'll let Frank you know tell you what he thinks. <laughs> Dino De Laurentiis came to you or brought you to do the project. Before you were even really, I never read. Aware. I never even heard the word Dune. He thought it was June. I thought he said June. <laughs> well, I do want to ask uh, Frank the question about the film, what he thinks of it, and and that's kind of a loaded question because Frank is a filmmaker himself, something I didn't know until today. So you're not working with someone who's not aware the of documentaries. But different thing. You're aware of the process. Oh yeah. Of, of, of the visual medium, and you're yeah. happy with the film. Well, I get asked a specific question a lot of times. If the settings, the scenes that I saw in David's film match my original imagination, the things that I projected in my imagination, and I must tell you that some of them do precisely. <clears throat> some of them don't, and some of them are better. Uh, which is what you would expect of... Uh, artists such as David and Tony Masters and um, I'm delighted with that I mean why not take it and improve on it visually as far as I'm concerned the film is a visual feast uh, I would love to have some of the scenes as stills to frame and have around me they're beautiful so you feel there was there was a synergy between the two of you the director the the uh, screenwriter and and the, and the actual creator of the concept Synergy? You mean the sum is more than the parts? <laughs> That's right. That something better came out of uh, out of the two of you working together. I think so. What was what was Frank's participation? I'm asking David this question. Well, I'm in the process of the film. 
I uh, signed on to do, you know, uh, Dune. And so I always, uh, when I was working on The Elephant Man, uh, I w worked with, you know, Christopher uh, DeVore and Eric Bergman. Um, and we tried to be true to the essence of, you know, The Elephant Man. And in Dune, I tried to be true to the essence of Frank's, you know, book, and which is not a, uh, an easy thing because there's so many different lines and so many different little things swimming about. Um, it's picking and choosing and condensing and, you know, all sorts of things. But so Frank's uh, contribution was, you know, the book and his support from day one all the way through to now. And he's always available, you know, for, you know, questions. And he's read almost every, you know, draft. Of the, I did seven drafts. And he's... Um, you know, allowed me to, you know, do my thing, and uh, and his book is uh, packed full with, you know, these what I call seed ideas. There's the big ideas, but there's so many little seed ideas, and um, those he let me, you know, sprout and uh, and run with, and that was the thrill for me because uh, there are things in the movie that were sparked, you know, by Frank, but they were allowed to, you know, to grow out. And uh, so, and I think it would be neat for people to, who have read the book, they will see, they'll see a, a, um, a difference, but, but it's true to the essence of uh, Frank's ideas. The film begins as the book begins, and it ends essentially as the, end, as the book ends. And I hear my dialogue all the way through it, not not just my dialogue, but there's lots of other dialogue. But I had the funny sensation in watching the rough cut, uh, not exactly too rough recently, of some of the cuts, the things that are not in there, of feeling that they'd happened just off stage or uh, we'd gone beyond them, but, but they'd happened, uh, that we hadn't really lost them. There are only, there were only two scenes that... Uh, that I missed in the film, but I know why they were cut. And they were pets of mine, and and you shouldn't have any pets when you're doing a, a screen. No, they were pets of mine too, but uh, I know which scenes they are. <laughs> but you know, those are the you know those are the things that uh, that's the trouble. The, the film right now is is two hours and twenty minutes, and it rolls along gangbusters. Um, but uh, certain scenes. Um, that uh, Frank and I both, you know, liked, uh, I think would have, you know, stopped the film. Mm -hmm. Was this merely a stroke of luck that, that two artists uh, from two different mediums, obviously two sensitive artists, uh, didn't really experience any substantial difficulty in molding or contributing to the production of this film? On my part, I consider it, you know, pretty lucky, yeah. Because I, th you I got think the it's license like you got, <clears throat> you did you expect the license that Frank gave you? With, with well, when I I met Frank, you know, three and a half years ago, you know, when I first signed on, and um, I didn't know who or what I was going to be meeting. I'd seen his picture of this, you know, bearded, uh, you know, guy <laughs> on his books, right? Guru, yeah, <laughs> and um, so, but it's turned out uh, to be like, uh, well, Frank is an idea man. And they're the best kind of, you know, people in my book and around. And ideas are, uh, everybody, you know, feeds off them, but very few people, you know, can catch them. And they're out there, but they're, you know, they're so elusive. And you have to, you know, uh, you know, be kind of sneaky and, and sneak up on them and, and to capture them. And uh, Frank uh, captures these, you know, fantastic ideas, and um, I really, you know, respect that. Frank, did, did, you're obviously satisfied with the result. Yes, you very said much so many times. But the funny thing happened. <clears throat> Dino called me. I didn't know David from Adams Off Ox, and he called me and he said that he had hired David Lynch to do the, to direct the film of Dune, and this was after a couple of. Um, well, I think they would have been disasters, <laughs> but then David knows why. Uh, so uh, I said, David who? <laughs> and uh, he said, David Lynch. Uh, uh, he said, uh, Elephant Man. 
and I hadn't seen Elephant Man. Mm. So I went out and got a tape of it and played it on my video. And I had this funny gut sensation. We had the guy who could do it. When you're doing a film, you're from a, the written word, you're translating into a different language. It's as though you were translating from English to Swahili. The, the visual language is a different language. And there was such subtlety and such beauty in, uh, uh, in The Elephant Man. I've seen it now about eight times, I think, and I get something new out of it each time. Uh, something peripheral or something right in the mainstream that was done visually as a visual metaphor. I've never told David this, but uh, but this is true. This this is what happened to me. I I had this gut sensation. I said, "We've got him." <laughs> you know, the guy who can do it. I'm glad we're having this talk, David. Did you, as a filmmaker, uh, I think by anyone's estimation, Dune was written uh, very visually. I mean, as a piece of literature, the, the visual description, uh, just the visualization of it is very immediate. Did that help you in your translation to the screen? Well, like I said, well, if you, I, I really, in a way, forget a lot of the book now because there have been so many drafts of a screenplay in between. But some things, I, I, I really think, in your mind, you think that Frank, you know, described things. But when you go searching, some things are described, of course. But a lot of things are uh, left to, you know, your imagination, even in, in the book. And um, that was deliberate, you, I might add. And you get a feeling and then your mind takes over from there. And so when a lot of times we'll go searching for descriptions of, of, of things, um, they weren't there. Or um, I realized that um, I was picturing something and I was, you know, falling in love with, you know, what I was picturing. And so... Uh, you know, the, like I said, Frank allowed me to, you know, to go with, you know, uh, my interpretation uh, and, and uh, you know, how things looked. And uh, because of that, you know, I was able to, uh, it was, it was, not, my interpretation was one thing. And then I started working with Tony and we went to, through two or three different uh, steps into uh, sort of the stratosphere of, you know, inter interpretation. And we got uh, clicking on four really nifty uh, different worlds and the look of each one. So the motion picture is, is truly uh, an entity unto oh, yeah. itself. Yeah. If you love the book, you'll love the motion picture even more because it's, 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 it takes on a new dimension. I, I, I can see how um, everyone who reads the book is going to interpret it and their interpretation is not mine but i have to you know it has to go through through me as a director. director's like a, you know uh, i always say like a filter and things pass through me and and it's it's not going to be other people's interpretation some people like uh may l love it and some people say it you know it's not what they pictured and they would be disappointed you know that's the way it is Again, the, the book being so visual, some people, anyone who's read it has been there before. Exactly. Yeah. What about the tools that you had to employ as a filmmaker, especially a modern filmmaker in this day and age? What did you do? What well, did you have fun with? Every this? technique known to filmmaking has been used on this picture, uh, except for stop motion, strangely enough, but every other th kind of thing. And uh, so... I've learned a tremendous amount uh, of, you know, technical things. We've built over uh, about 80 sets in uh, what amounted to 16 sound stages down in Mexico. We've traveled all over the world, Rafael and I, uh, Rafael De Laurentiis is a producer, um, first looking for locations and finding, finally uh, going to Mexico. Um, I've seen actors, you know, for this picture all over the world, and people in this film are from all over the world. The crew is from all over the world. At one point, there was 1,700 people on the crew, and that's that's a huge amount of people. And sometimes I turn around on the set, there'd be 600 people. Uh, they're not extras, you know, crew people or visitors or camera crews or whatever, uh, you know, on the set. So it's been a 
uh, strange experience, but a huge, fantastic uh, experience. What are some of the techniques? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I want to add a little bit to this. A very strange thing happened at the rap party down in Mexico. Uh, at least a dozen of the actors and actresses who were in it came up to me and said individually the more or less the same thing, that they were sorry it was over, they had such a good time. So it wasn't necessarily a grueling experience that mm-hmm. drove everyone insane. No, we were we were uh, really together. It was it was a great experience, and we were in a, a foreign world. We were in you know uh, Mexico City, uh, uh, which is I still I will always feel the perfect place to make Dune because Dune is a, is a foreign world and four foreign worlds. And if I was making it in, in uh, Arizona, it would be too normal, you know. Mexico City was just the right atmosphere and the right mood to kind of let your, just it was to help your mind get out there, you know, into um, Dune. There was a certain kind of rapport between the producer and director. Uh, we had our disagreements, but they weren't, they weren't major disagreements. They weren't shouting disagreements or anything like that. If you could explain your, your point, people listened to you. The only time that I objected to something that was going to be done, David and Raphael and everybody else listened to me, and they didn't do the thing that I didn't want done. I can't remember what it was. You weren't going to kill off? Oh, yes, that's right. Yes, yeah. yeah and it's the only thing I didn't yeah, right, to. Exactly, yeah. Did mm-hmm. he kill them off then? No. Yeah, they did. Oh, you but in the proper way. Yeah. In the proper way, yeah. yeah. So we'll see <clears throat> that when we go to the motion picture. You'll see an authentic uh, scene that's from, from the book, and uh, uh, very poignant. Mm-hmm. Who's going to be killed? Let's don't tell them. So there are two more Dune projects, potential Dune projects already in the, already works. In the works. I've started writing on, on the script on Dune 2, and um, it needs a lot more work, and then I'll, I'll show it to Frank and uh, see what he thinks. He'll be a tough audience. I <laughs> Tougher than hell. <laughs> now, you're, you didn't, uh, it's, it's interesting that, that Frank didn't do the screenplays for Dune. Why did that happen? Well, I did a screenplay, and it was awful. <clears throat> um, so I never read Frank's <laughs> script. I don't believe it was awful. I don't know, you know... It was too I, long. It lacked the proper visual metaphors. Um, I was too close to the book to be able to see it as a, as a film. David didn't have that problem. Uh, working on this film with David has taught me one great deal about taking the printed word, a screenplay, and making it into a film. Now I feel competent to do a screenplay. I don't know if I can do a screenplay of one of my own books, but, uh, well, yes, I can. I'm doing it. Good. So you have mm-hmm. definitely learned from each other in this experience a great deal. I would say you so, may. yeah. Mm-hmm. And that would would make the next two pictures, I would think, something you'd look forward to. Oh yeah, I look forward to you know. Uh, I'm 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 a little bit what we all are. We're a little bit doomed out right now. Mm-hmm. But um, doomed in, we say. Right. Three, three and a half <laughs> years you've been on this project. That's <clears throat> right. Three and a half years. It's a long time. But the results are, from what everyone says, well worth the effort. What and that leads me to the, to the last question I want to ask David. As a filmmaker, have you have you thought of how the public's going to respond to this? In other words, as you've made the film, have you had a place in your mind where you've been, been contemplating what the response will be, how people will react to what you're doing? Well, I've thought about um, a lot about the films that I've, you know, loved and what it was. It, it wasn't... Uh, it was a... Uh, an experience that I had while watching them that I couldn't get anywhere else. I never got it anywhere else, ever. And I would so gladly, you know, pay my five dollars to, you know, to have that experience. And it took me, the films that I loved uh, took me to uh, an, another place, even if it was 20 years ago or present day, but another place, and gave me an experience. And I think that's what I that's what I hope Dune will will do, and it's four different you know worlds and and a and a and a trip you know through them that you can't experience uh, anywhere else ever. Thank you very much, David, for sharing your thoughts and some background on the film. Thanks a million. Books. 
Frank Herbert, every question that could have ever been asked of you has probably been asked. Ask me a new one. But I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to go back to the beginning and maybe a little beyond to the real genesis of Dune and where it started for Frank Herbert, the author. Not necessarily where it began as a project, as a book, but, but where it began for you, for Frank Herbert. Well, I'm a history buff and have been a history buff since I was quite young. And while reading history, I got the idea that we had not looked at the messianic impulse in human society from a point of view that I de knew could be developed, uh, reporting uh, that uh, this person came on the scene and these people followed and this is what happened. It was a, uh, a kind of a journalistic approach to it. I didn't mind the you are there approach, but what I wanted was something that showed the impact of a messiah on history as the creator of a power structure. Because inevitably, no matter how good the Messiah, other people enter the scene, other people are attracted to the power structure. I think that the idea of power corrupting and absolute power corrupting absolutely is not on the mark, does not hit it. I think what happens is that power attracts the corruptible. That's an interesting concept. In fact, that's almost the antithesis, the reverse of the process that is commonly accepted. I think this is why uh, great power centers such as the Kremlin, uh, the Pentagon, uh, Kedossi, uh, Sandhurst, become essentially uh, cesspools, really, <clears throat> because they get so many people there who are what power for the sake of power. And it's my estimation of it that a high percentage of these people are certifiable. You get real nuts. This is why you get people, for example, going to Guyana and drinking Kool-Aid, because the errors of the leader are amplified by the number who follow without question. That was the beginning. I wanted to do a Messiah story that explored this. The way that you perceived power structures at that time and wanted to make a statement about it, is this, you mentioned just a moment ago, that a Messiah can create or develop a power structure. It occurs around the Messiah. That's what I guess uh, hmm. my question is. Does the Messiah walk in, sometimes even inadvertently, to a culture or a society who has already built a power structure? Every Messiah I've focus? studied, every Messiah I've studied in history was a reformer, and for good reason. Jesus wanted to uh, reform the uh, rabbinate. He, he had a, uh, a belief that uh, it had become corrupted. The rabbinical movement had become corrupted. The same is true of Muhammad. He was a reformer. Zoroaster was a reformer. <clears throat> Each of these individuals obviously was charismatic. Charismatic leaders are dangerous because people don't question them. They see the obvious thing that the charismatic leader is saying that this needs reforming. So they fall into line behind the charismatic leader. And as I say, even if the charismatic leader is absolutely right and perfect in all of his judgments, eventually you get a power structure which it accumulates like uh, filings uh, accumulating in a magnet <clears throat> all around the polarized places in this power structure. So the power structure does evolve as a result of the Messiah's activities. That's right. And, but not just the Messiah's activities. It evolves because of the way people respond to a charismatic leader. So it's part of the forms of our society, you see. But in the case of Jesus, you mentioned a moment ago, weren't the Hebrews waiting for a Messiah long before? Oh, yes, the messianic uh, myth was, was there. Uh, Preceded in, his in arrival. The, in their history, yes. Of course, he never really uh, exemplified the Messiah 
Of course, there's some question whether he said uh, he was the Messiah. Uh, The uh, uh, Buddha was a reformer. See, and, and Jesus was a reformer. Each, in each instance, you have an individual on the scene, a charismatic leader, who sees something that needs fixing. There's a repair job something necessary. Something that's obvious to everyone. Yes, and, and a lot of people say, yes, you're absolutely right, Mr. Charismatic Leader, and there, we will follow you. There's a broad truth to yes. anything that's said, so it's yeah. easy to follow. And then you get a movement going. This is sequential. These things happen... Uh, but they don't happen just because of the charismatic leader. They happen because the society picks up on it. But the society had created a need or a void for well, the, the charismatic leader before that individual something, arrived? Something had occurred in the society that the charismatic leader latches onto. Now, please turn the cassette over to continue. The stage is set no. prior to the Messiah's arrival. That's right. Do societies truly create the Messiahs from within? Oh, I think so. Mm-hmm. I think that the that we kind of create a, a vortex into which the Messiah is sucked. People ask me if I'm starting a cult, and I really I avoid that like the plague. I don't want to be a cult leader. I'm not your guru. You be your own guru. Is that why you shaved your beard? That's, this is the new Frank Herbert. <laughs> <laughs> we do nasty things to our leaders. We shoot them in the streets of Dallas and uh, uh, hang them on pieces of wood at Golgotha. The whole structural form out of which charismatic leaders evolve, that's the thing that I was addressing. But the process starts, and you were referring a moment ago to what happens next. The leader evolves, the leader emerges, and then things begin to happen. Well, remember that Dune, Dune Messiah, and Children of Dune were one book in my head. Mm -hmm. And Dune Messiah was a pivotal book, which turns over the whole picture, changes your view of history. This is why a lot of people had trouble with it, you see. Because I had created a charismatic leader, you would follow Paul for all of the right reasons. He was honest, trustworthy, loyal to his people, up to the point of giving his life for them if they wanted it. And the response and to the, him? The response to him was to follow him slavishly, to not question him. I think, for example, that John Kennedy was the most dangerous president we've had in recent years. Not because I think the man was evil. I think he was a great guy, and I'd have enjoyed drinking with him and having playing cards with him. But because people did not question him. So you are obviously a questioning authority. Oh, absolutely. Do you consider yourself an iconoclast? Indeed. With, with the relationship between the Messiah and the followers, there's a, again, I want to go back to the process. It all begins well, and it all seems very good sweetness and light mm-hmm. and then something happens or something begins to evolve a new structure stupid. evolves and people take it over other people get into the act so the, how they drain power away from the Messiah of course after they <clears throat> it is delegated and how does that happen it happens in this out of a structural force that is in the society. And I think one of the best examples we have of that in recent times that we can look at with a certain degree of historical clarity is what happened in the Soviet Union. The October Revolution had real evils to address. The Tsarist regime was one of the most evil regimes that this world has ever seen. The oppression was obvious? Yeah. Marx and the others came in and filled that into that vortex and took it over. Now, what has evolved out of that? They have evolved a bureaucratic aristocracy, which is almost a precise copy of the Tsarist regime. And this might have this mm-hmm. might have contributed to the fall of, of Nikita Khrushchev. He was the last singular identity as a human being that I recall, Mm -hmm. in the Soviet Union. Since then, the power has filtered down, broadened, and diffused. 
So that is the process that no. will take place in any similar situation. I think, think so. Human I think I think well, I don't think it's human nature. I th well, human nature uh, is involved in it, of course, but I think it is an essential part of the forms that people develop and call government. Which they create for themselves. Yeah. Uh, it's a kind of an evolutionary process, I believe, that has come out of tribal forms. A feudatory is a tribe. So we have this marvelous historical example. It's happened in our lifetimes in the Soviet Union. We have seen them reconstitute the czarist regime. Without an individual yeah. on which to focus. But all of the bureaucracy is there, you see. Even with some of the same names, same, same titles, I mean. So Paul, in Dune, is caught in this kind of a vortex. Now, did Paul come to a society seeking that Messiah? He came to a society that was prepared to welcome a, Mos a Messiah. So they, uh, his reception was was favorable. Oh yes, and and he was launched not only on his own initiative and ambition. If he had that, the necessities of, ambition, of his decision making were obvious, and the society lifted him hmm. quite willingly mm -hmm. to where he ended up. That's correct. Everything else that you created, you were described once, I know, as a world maker. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let me let me rephrase that. Maybe a world dreamer. You obviously had to to create this world of doom. It began with Paul. It began with this messianic uh, impulse, the study, the interest that you had as an individual, as a writer, and then the rest. How did it grow outward from that? The first pr thing you have to do is to create the Messiah, the the charismatic leader that people will follow for all of the correct reasons. They, they can justify everything they do to follow him. And you accept it as a reader. Then we have Dune Messiah, which is the evolution of the power structure. And how devolution begins to set in. And you get the cynicism arising. And you get a turnover of things that were good in Dune that now you get a different look at. You look at them from a different angle. Does the perspective you get change? Well, pre yeah, the pr perspective does change. The angle of view changes. Uh, prescience, which figures so prominently in Dune. And I'm talking to a society which believes that prediction is a great thing. Uh, <clears throat> but if I were to give you a, an absolute prediction, John, of everything that's going to happen to you from this moment to the moment of your death, your whole life would be instant replay and an utter bore. And yet that's your role. Yeah, but that's, and that's the thing people think they want. But what they really want is they want to know what U.S. Steel is going to do on the big board next week. And uh, will she or won't she? And give me a couple of winners at Hialeah while you're at it. You see? <laughs> but isn't this tremendous response that you've received from your writing uh, based upon that, that eagerness, people wanting to know, people wanting a window to the future? Oh, yes. But you see, it's the future that is the qu in question. The value of surprise gets thrown out the window if you believe in absolute prescience. Now, you've created a future. As we yeah. said, you're a world, a world maker, a world dreamer. Why did you create Dune? Why that planet? Why such an arid, lifeless place? Well, it's a testing place, for one thing. And all of the great religions that we know about came out of the wilderness. So I created a kind of an amplified wilderness. How much of this then, of your work, of your writing, of all the writing that you've done, uh, the science fiction writing that you've done, how much of that is a reflection of you and your beliefs as you perceive this planet and our social structures? Well, I, th I think we have to reform our social structures. I really do. And uh, I have certain metaphors in the Dune books that I deliberately chose to shape people's view of the forms. For example, uh, the worms. The worms are the monster, the mindless monster in the depths that guards the pearl of great price. It is the uh, 
the unconscious animal. It's the black bull of the corrida. You see? It limits your options of how to deal with it. Yeah. It is the, the welling of violence that comes out of humankind. So in describing or creating a wilderness, then you're exposing uh, elements. Again, I go to the, the phrase human nature, mm -hmm. elements of the human condition. I noticed that, that, that it's very humanoid. The future remains very humanoid. Well, I want real people that you would identify with. And also that they respond uh, in many ways uh, in a very consistent fashion to what we experience now. There's a tremendous amount of conflict in your writing. Many things are resolved by conflict. Now, is that is that a prediction of the future, or is that then, as that's you said, the metaphor, the reflection of the now? That's the way I read history. If you read history, isn't that the way human beings have done for, since we began chiseling our words in stone? And as it has been, then it will continue to be. Unless we change the forms. Now, I don't want to, to breed out or condition out of humankind. Um, the competitiveness because we're in a universe which can throw surprises at us despite our predictions despite our best predictions and we have to be able to respond to this universe with all of our options open we don't close off any options if we can respond non-violently that of course is preferable but if all that's left to us is violence, then we dare not close off that option. You seem to be implying that we have the ability to change a legacy of the ages, that we can actually attempt and perhaps succeed at something that mankind has failed to accomplish since the beginning of mankind. Do you really have that much faith in, in the resiliency and the elasticity of the human form? Yes, I think we're the best equipped survival animal that this planet has ever produced. I don't depend just on rationality. I depend on the need to survive, on the urge to survive, on the, on the desire to survive as a species. This is behind a lot of what I write. It pleases me to think that 20,000 years in the future, 20 million years in the future, there will be human beings around enjoying life the way I enjoy life. The World Without War Council. Oh, yes. As a member of the Collegium of the World Without War Council, uh, I have um, uh, bowed out of active participation, although not out of uh, uh, belief in, in that kind of work, I think that we can't address this problem of war unless we address our own bureaucratic tendencies, our uh, tendencies to create a, a structure such as the World Without War Council, which then becomes much more interested in maintaining its own form, its own identity, the ongoing need for its services rather than to create an organization, a form, which puts itself out of business. How does this dedication to peace uh, manifest itself in your writing? Um, showing people some alternatives, showing them the consequences of violence, uh, displaying uh, uh, alternative forms, showing them how the old patterns repeat themselves, you describe, well, you have many emperors in your writing. Now, um, as a reflection of the 20th century, for example, what do you see as, as the preferable leadership, a style of leadership, an evolution of leadership? Well, m my own response politically is that uh, I vote against anybody in office. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the that we have the we've had the examples of how to deal with political power 
and that is to give it very briefly. Why is it that in your writing, you the when we when there are a thousand emperors, or when when leadership is broken down and I'm dissected, saying, and bisected, that that's the you reference that I think is the Dark Ages. All I'm saying there, John, is that the aristocratic forms repeat themselves. Uh-huh. Aristocracy is a repetitive structure in our world. More of a bad thing doesn't improve it. That's what I'm saying. Yes. You talk about religion, and you take perspective. Another power on structure. Very much so. You also talk about the inside and the outside, mm-hmm. about creating the uh, a need for your own leadership. Right. How is that manifested in our own society? We see organizations develop which work unconsciously, for the most part, to maintain those conditions which require their services. And it's subconscious? I think mostly unconscious, yes. That all of these structures, these organizations, become much more career-oriented, much more oriented on maintaining the need for their own services and their own ongoing participation in power. Is it a natural process, for example, that bureaucracy begets bureaucracy? I think it's self-seeding, yes. And then how can that be broken? Or can it be broken of its own will? I think you need to break it by bringing the final judgment, the final determination on who holds power back into the hands of what we like to call the grassroots. I would like to see, in the United States, for example, some real democracy. I would like to see review committees with enormous power, very short-term tenure, maybe one year, small budgets, and never able to serve again on such a committee, only once in a lifetime. I would like to see such review committees called into uh, action automatically, given certain conditions. Declaration of war, for example. At a local level, if a school board is going to spend, say, $200,000, automatically, a review committee, called into being, uh, and called at random from the polls of the people who voted in the previous election, and give them the power of life and death over what the school board wants to do. Will Will they do it? Will they always act perfectly? No, they won't. But if they only have tenure for a year, then you can go at it again. And you will go at it having learned something from the actions of the previous review committee. Is this an extension of the existing set of checks and balances that we currently have? It's another check and balance that I would like to, to reinstall into our democratic system. But much more localized. Oh, not only localized. I would like to have it at, at the local level, at the county level, at the state level, and at the federal level. In broad terms, are you supportive of uh, diffusing a large centralized power source? Oh yes, in in broad terms I am. I think we need certain central powers, but I think we have to limit the tenure of whoever holds that power, and severely limit it, and so it's arbitrary. They can only, for example, I think that we ought to have uh, one-term senators, and maybe two-term congressmen, and that we ought to have a one-term president, maybe give him six years, and that senators ought to be four years and one term, and congressmen maybe two terms, two years. Wouldn't that much activity, coming and going in in political office, create a volatile uh, state of affairs for a society? I think that it would demand that the society keep its eye on what was hap- on what was happening, and that's what we don't have now. In Dune, going back to the book, going back to how that is is reflected in your writing, mm-hmm. um, you have, uh, of course, the the, the tribal the Fremen. entity, mm-hmm. the Fremen, uh, responding as a tribe, mm-hmm. responding primitively, but in quite sophisticated labor too. What effect would uh, would your suggestions have on a society? Would it it would obviously not tend to become more primitive and more basic in its decision making, it would have to become much more enlightened, I would think. We have to be much more aware of what's going on. I had a a senior bureaucrat in the school system in the state of Washington when I expounded this idea to him. He, He said, 
you think some damned housewife could understand the complexities of what the school board has to do? And my response immediately is, yes, you bet I think a housewife would understand them. She would understand these things out of necessity. I think if you throw the responsibility, the full responsibility onto people, they rise to the occasion. Back to Frank Herbert as the writer, uh, obviously very politically aware and, and tremendously sensitive to political and social issues. That was the basis then for Dune, well, remember for the, all of Dune. Remember, before writing Dune, I was the speechwriter for a United States senator with two offices in Washington, D.C. I've been right on the inside of the apple, so I know what's going on back there. I am a political animal, and I've really never left journalism. I'm writing about the current scene. The metaphors are there. I'm writing about the political ecology, the uh, religious ecology, the social ecology, and the physical ecology of our world. And I think you do not separate any one part of this from the others. You don't separate mind and body and understand the human being. And therefore, you don't separate any of these elements and understand what's going on in our world. We fondly say that in the United States, we separate church and state. That's an asinine statement. There's nothing more emotional than religion. Nothing more emotionally demanding than religion. Because it is the promise of survival. You can't take that out of politics. You get heated emotions aroused. I am a political animal, and that's what I'm writing about. I'm writing about the economic ecology, the, the politics of all of these things that influence our lives. The response that you get to your writing, the way people mirror your writing back to you, is it satisfactory? Oh yes, people are thinking and asking interesting questions because of what I write. You're impacting then your readers the way you want to. Oh yes. Mm. And you continue to. I hope so. And you have a new book in the spring called Chapter House Dune. That's right. Where is that going to it's take It's the sixth b Dune book and it uh, begins with a Bene Gesserit planet which is being converted into another dune and goes from there. Thank you very much, Frank Herbert, for sharing your thoughts on Dune, your writings, and sharing your thoughts on our world with Walden Books. Uh, we wish you the best of luck with the motion picture, Dune, soon to be released, and look forward to Chapter House, Dune. We hope you've enjoyed getting to know Frank Herbert a little more closely. Watch for Dune, the motion picture from Universal and Dino De Laurentiis. And enjoy all of Frank Herbert's books available in Walden Bookstores. We want to invite you to send us your comments and suggestions for other programs you'd like to hear. In return for writing us, we'll send you our latest catalog listing all of our materials. Send your comments to Listen and Learn, Post Office Box 1084, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Thanks for listening. We'd be happy to listen to you, too.